Wine TV. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Elite Wine TV. I'm Hello, everybody. Welcome to Elite Wine TV. Hello everybody, welcome to Elite Wine TV. I'm your host Mark Fusco here for another edition of the show. All right, so we are doing the New Year's Eve special and um, I've cobbled together, so to speak, uh, three sparkling wines um, for your uh, uh, consideration, I guess. And um, anyway, uh, these were acquired through either I bought them or they were given to me um, by uh, people in the industry. And uh, these are a hugely wide-ranging um, uh, group of wines. And uh, I now I remembered what I was going to look up. <laughs> um, anyway, uh, while I'm uh, stalling and uh, doing all that. So I've got three different wines here. Uh, the first wine we're going to do was actually a wine that I bought not to drink, um, but it was actually for a, um, our SOM group to... <laughs> Um, it was for our SOM group to, um, here we go. I'm trying to, I'm trying to get this little, um, there we go. Something, some information about, about something. Anyway, so this first wine, uh, was a, um, wine that I wasn't, wasn't meant for drinking, bought it for the SOM group. And, uh, it was for our, uh, once a month or so we, we practice service. For um, for exams for for the certified and advanced and higher exams, I guess we don't really do. I don't think we've ever done a mock master exam, even though one of our candidates, one of our people, is a master candidate. Um, but we we practice mostly certified exam stuff. We don't really get into the advanced too much of the advanced stuff. Um, but anyway, we um, we practice service. So you either do decanting, which is supposed to be red wine. A vintage red wine that you're decanting for sediment, not decanting to aerate. That's a different type of um, procedure. Really, there's not much to it. You're just you're just going to pour the wine in the decanter. You're not even worried about it. Trying to be gentle with it. And then you have sparkling wine service. Well, I bought a few sparkling wines. I bought the cheapest that they had at the uh, local HEB um, <clears throat> after work one day after work one night, and um, I uh, didn't realize that. This didn't really have the traditional cork and capsule on it. It's really a screw cap. So we ended up not using these bottles. Um, the gentleman who uh, runs the wine bar that we do a lot of our a lot of our um, uh, stuff at High Street Wine Company. So if you're ever in San Antonio, you should totally check out this place. It's like one of the coolest wine bars, and it's run by a super awesome dude named Scott Oda. Um, and he's, he's, he's the master candidate in town. He's an advanced sommelier. And, um, besides just having just good wine, there's also stuff for like us, for like kind of the Psalms in the city. Um, nothing too crazy, um, nothing too terribly expensive, but you know, it's kind of like the wine bar that you would want to go to type of thing. And then his pricing, pricing is very reasonable. So anyway, he, he helped, he supplied some of the wine and, <clears throat> Uh, matter of fact, I actually gave some of these, some of the bottles that we weren't going to using to, uh, there was a lady that was there that was going to help him with doing some stuff. Um, and I said, here, take it. And I took, I kept, I think two bottles. Um, well, yeah, I have two bottles. I kept two bottles, one for sure I was going to use for New Year's Eve. And I don't know why I kept the other one other than I paid for it. And why not? I have no idea what the quality of that wine is. Uh, the second wine is a wine that was given to me by, um, uh, I can't remember, I'll pull up the, the uh, email. Uh, but a lady who works for uh, Frigine, uh, um, I'm sorry, or Gloria Ferrer, Frigine, uh, works for that company and sent me a sample bottle. And then the last bottle was a bottle given to me by a friend in the industry who works for a um, uh, distributor. And it was as, uh, it's late at night, I've been watching Doctor Who on the BBC uh, marathon. Um, and he gave it to me as a, basically a present. Um, for turning 50. Yes, I am 50 years old. 
um, or turn 50 in September. So it was a, it was a belated birthday present. And these glasses are dirty. All right, well, we'll just have to deal with it. Um, anyway, uh, so let's get into the wine. Uh, I'm not doing anything super fancy with, you know, as far as opening. Just gonna rip the, some, rip the uh, foil off here. This one I don't have to, shouldn't have to worry too much about. So what is this one? This wine, as I destroy all that, this is the J. Roger, not Paul Roger, as in P-O-L, Paul, Paul Roger. This is the J. Roger, American sparkling, oh, sorry, American champagne, brut. Um, a sparkling wine, secondary fermentation before bottling. Now, that tells me this is not in the champenois method, which means that the second fermentation happens in the bottle. This basically happened in a big tank. The second fermentation that gives you the bubbles and then they move it into the bottle. Um, so who's J. Roger? Before we open the bottle, let's, let's talk about J. Roger. J. Roger is an American sparkling wine. Um, it's out of New York and, and I, I'm gonna really butcher the name of the town. Uh, Canon, Canandaigua, Canandaigua. I have no idea. I'm sure it's an old, you know, American Indian, Native American name, um, you know, something. Um, anyway, so who are they? You know, if you just if you try to go to, uh, if you try, if you just type in J. Roger Winery, um, you don't really get a whole lot. Uh, so other than just a bunch of websites that sell it, um, you might get the connection of who owns it. Um, you may have to go a little bit deeper, but um, there is no actual website for this wine, okay, or the winery that produces it. Um, I did uh, uh, find uh, my buddy Jeremy Parzin uh, wrote a little uh, article uh, on his uh, in the Houston Press, and it's probably also on his blog, but I'll have a link to the Houston Press article. Um, from 2013, so like four years ago, uh, talking about he was at a hotel in New York and the person, the bartender said, oh yeah, we have champagne for $5 a glass. And he being, being a, a very uh, well, uh, well, a very knowledgeable wine person, um, probably was like, well, okay, what's the deal? Ordered it and uh, they told him it was uh, Roger. And he went, like, Paul Roger? And the bartender said, yeah, of course because the bartender didn't know. And then when he tasted it, he realized uh, that it was not Paul Roger, it was something else. And they showed the bottle and he has a picture of it on the blog, on the blog post. So bought this at HEB um, for $5.99. So it already tells you this is not a, a very expensive wine. You can see it has a screw cap on it. So um, who are they? And who's this Can uh, Canandaigua uh, winery? Well, um, uh, I, he, he referenced a uh, website, and I think I got the same one from New York um, or something similar, and it gave me an, a, a huge history of this company, and it was started in um, 19, hold on, 1945, um, 45, 48, depending on what you're, what you're looking at, but um, uh gentleman by the name of, oh, I just lost it, Mac Sands um, in 1935, uh, Mac Sands opened the Car Cal Winery located in North Carolina, uh, produced uh, quite a few wines. His son Marvin uh, uh, got into the industry and was determined to open a winery of his own. In 45, he opened, uh, or he, he when his, his, his family purchased a sauerkraut factory, of all things, uh, turned into a winery located in the name I can't pronounce, uh, New York. It's in the Finger Lakes region and established the, the brand, the company. Um, so w whether you want to say 35 or 45 and then in 48, uh, Carcal uh, was closed and all wine production was transferred to uh, the Canandaigua uh, wine, wine company or whatever it was called industries. So, um, they, they basically built an empire from that, uh, bought a bunch of other properties, mostly wineries, um, a huge portfolio of, of, of wineries. And I'll go through what, what they had before they ch had their name change. 
um, real quick. So uh, some of the highlights, because they, they owned a ton of places, a ton of things. Um, I was just trying to get through this real quick. Uh, well, Barton Brands. Um, so all the Barton stuff, distilleries and, and wineries. Um, they also bought... Um, but well, Batavia was something else, and they renamed it Batavia. It was a, a French wine company. Um, they named a whole bunch of other stuff. During the hit, you know, I'm not going to go through the history. Oh, they, they invented Arbor Mist. Um, they bought um, black, uh, black Velvet. They bought um, over the years. What else did they buy? Uh, Inglenook, the Inglenook brand. Um, Though I, th but that eventually became Inglenook that Coppola owns. So it's just kind of a weaving of stuff. Um, and then, uh, um, oh, what was it? It was an A. Almeida um, Winery. Anyway, I'm, I'm rambling. We just get to the wine. Uh, or who, who, who owns it now? Constellation. That's who owns it now. That's what they became in uh, 2000, I believe it was. And I'm going to scroll real quick down. In 2000, they changed the name to Constellation Brands to reflect the scope of the company in its range of brands. Um, and that's from the Wikipedia page. And uh, so what, who, what are they responsible for now? Um, you may have heard of a few of these places. Robert Mondavi, Wild Horse Winery, Claude Dubois, Franciscan Estates, Kim Crawford, Naomi, Mark West, Rufino, The Prisoner... Uh, the Prisoner Wine Company. Um, they also have beers. Uh, so Corona, uh, they, they import. Corona Modelo, Especial Negro Modelo, Pacifico, uh, Ballast Point, and Funky Buddha. Um, and then they have spirits, Black Velvet, uh, Svetka, Casanoble, Tequila, and High West Whiskey, among a whole bunch of other stuff. So I'll let, you know, I'll have links to uh, their, the Constellations website, this, this company, this uh, website that has the the big history of the prior company, uh, Jeremy's stuff, and then um, the um, maybe even the Wikipedia page, I'm not sure. Anyway, so let's talk about American Champagne real quick because um, you know you might go, well, Mark, I thought uh, Champagne has to come from Champagne. It does, but there's a little loophole. And uh, I just pulled up an article that says the 100 year old, no, don't sign me up. Um, the 100-year-old loophole that makes California champagne legal. Now, here's the thing. This is made in New York, and I have no idea what the grapes are. Like, there's no way to know. It could be Chardonnay. It could be Riesling. It could be, I don't know, Columbard, I, Sauvignon Blanc. I don't know. It could be highly doubted Pinot Noir and that they're making a, a Blanc de Noir out of it. But anyway, um, so... The thing is, and I'm going to try to get to the where the where the uh, where this article talks about it. But there's a bunch of treaties that are involved that that you know allow you know make sure that you you have a, something that's uh, named for a place that it actually comes from that place. Um, port wine, um, champagne, Burgundy, Chablis, um, things like that. So um, I'm trying to see here. In 1983, okay, so here's the loophole. Go ahead and get to the end of the article. If a producer had used or abused, uh, from the French point of view, one of the names prior, one of those protected names, place names, um, prior to March 10th, 2006, they could continue to use the name on their label indefinitely. Although these names were... Although these names were and continue to be used for the most part by lower end winemakers, uh, the CIVC, that's the body that, that protects and, and kind of runs a lot of the champagne stuff, were enraged in the long, were enraged in the long sought victory. It is an absurdity on a moral point of view. <laughs> um, anyway, uh, that was a quote from them. So, um, anyway, they, uh, Basically, how, how all the treaties and how all the stuff how all the stuff came about. Um, the agreement happened in 2005, and it said in exchange for easing trade restrictions on wine, the American government agreed that California Champagne, Chablis, Sherry, and a half dozen other semi-generic names was what 
what that is, American Champagne, would no longer appear on domestic wine labels. That is, unless the producer was already using one of those names. So if I come up with a winery in the United States and I create a sparkling wine, whether it's truly champagne, you know, method champagne, uh, method champenois, uh, or it's this type of secondary, secondary fermentation not in the bottle, um, I can't call it American champagne. I can't call it Texas champagne or whatever. I have to call it sparkling wine. Okay, but if I bought this brand right now, if I laid down a few billion dollars to buy Constellation or I ripped this away from Constellation somehow, I can still continue to use name because the brand was already established. All right, so let's get into this wine. It says the screw cap. Has all the bubbles. It's woo, almost. All right. So this is. Price point wise, this is the kind of sparkling wine you're going to have at, you know, a, uh, what, a, a casual party at your house, New Year's Eve or Christmas party, or just you want to celebrate something or you want to have something that you don't want to spend a lot of money on. So let's just check it out. All right on the aromas. Pretty basic citrus. Touch of apple. Touch of melon too. I mean, we, we might be talking uh, Chardonnay here. There's not a whole lot else going on. Um, I don't really get any type of uh, bre bre bready or yeasty type of aromas that would indicate like aging on lees, which I would not expect it to. It's probably, as soon as it's finished fermenting, they probably inject it with a bunch of sugar, ferment it again, get the bubbles going and put it out. So, not much else. I mean, the aromas are pretty much gone. I had a good friend of mine tell me, don't swirl champagne or sparkling wine, but there's a bit of, um, There's a hint of toast in that, actually. I'm swirling. And honestly, a bit of plastic. It's a bit of lime. Um, a touch of orange and tangerine to it. Um, and there was this, not a bitterness to it, but like burnt toast now. Um, so it gets somewhat bitter, like a burnt toast action to it. Um, and, uh, Caramelized, like a like a burnt sugar type of thing, and it's not. I'm going to concentrate on the burnt part of it, but like it's it's been caramelized, right? So it's seen some heat. Maybe you know you you had some creme brulee and you 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 burnt the sugar on it, but it, it's not burnt sugar. It's just caramelized. I mean, it's you know innocent enough of a of a wine. A bit of tanginess to it. For being a sparkling wine, there's there's a bit of somewhat creaminess, but there's also a bit of flatness to it. Um, <clears throat> considering sort of screw cap and how much action there was once I opened it up, I'm going to assume, and it looks like it's in a more, uh, probably not exactly a standard uh, bottle, but um, it's probably not in a bottle like this one as far as like the strength of the bottle. So my guess is it's not upwards of the six or so atmospheres that uh, champagne bottle or, or method champagne uh, wines will have. It's probably a little bit lower uh, atmosphere. Um, so that's probably why you're not getting as much of the, of the um, bubble feel. Remember, it has nothing to do with the glass. All, all a flute does is it gives, it gives uh, the, the, the wine uh, a more focused and concentrated 
um, area to, to bubble up. And usually champagne flutes have a little bit of etching in the bottom because that, that's how you get the little bubbles. Whereas regular wine glasses don't. So you, you don't really see the, the, um, the fizz. I mean, it's a $6 bottle of wine. If you're going on the cheap, if you're if you need to buy a whole bunch of sparkling wine for a party and you don't you don't want to be spending like, you know, $30, $40 a bottle and you're gonna be buying like three cases of this stuff, and it's a party, and no one's really gonna care, especially if most of your friends are not wine snobs, um, it serves a purpose. Uh, um, they're, they're going to love it because they're having a good time. So the wine's just, it's secondary to the experience. Um, but that's just any wine, any wine, you can have any okay wine in, in a, in a really good environment and people are going to like the wine. Uh, and when you're in a more controlled setting or if someone says, Oh, what's the wine? Oh, yeah, had Jay Roger. All right, cool. And they go and buy it and they, they get home and they're all excited. It was going to be so great. And they go, Oh, it wasn't that great because it was the experience. Okay. Um, yeah, anyway, um, if, if you need something cheap, buy it. You can buy anything in this price point. It's all going to probably taste very similar. What's the grape variety? Probably Chardonnay. Um, but if it's coming from New York, I wouldn't be surprised if it's, if it's Riesling. Um, I mean, it, it has a, a little more fruit characteristic, um, extra fruit characteristic. I wouldn't say call, I wouldn't call it a fruit cup that Rieslings might have, but, um, it could be just a mishmash of white grapes, just whatever was cheap. Um, Rieslings and Chardonnays and anything else. Um, but yeah, it's probably what it is. Um, real quick, real quick. So I don't, I don't get a lot of, uh, I don't get a lot of comments on YouTube and uh, I also don't get a lot of negative comments, but I had a couple, I've had a couple people give me something the, over the past couple months, actually. Uh, one guy was, I knew you were, I knew you were something like a snob or, or whatever, cause you spit, I'm out of here. I'm like, all right. So if you're first time watching this, and you just saw me spit. Um, you know what? There's a reason I spit. Am I gonna, I'm at home. I'm, I'm, do I really care if I get drunk off of these wines? I'm not gonna get drunk off of the three tastes. I, I get it. Um, I'm also only recording one episode tonight. I typically record three, four, five, six episodes, and sometimes there's more than one wine per episode. So if I actually drank all the wines, by the time I get to episode five or six, I'm going to be inebriated, so I cannot evaluate the wines. So that's one reason why I spit. Two, it, it, it's, it just has become a habit for me. It's part of showing professionalism. Um, I am in the wine profession. Uh, I'm not just some somebody that just enjoys wine, like a wine enthusiast. And, um, and all kinds of stuff. You know, I've seen some spirits and beer uh, uh, review uh, videos out there on YouTube and they don't spit. Um, that's their choice. Um, again, they're probably in a controlled environment. They may only be recording one episode at a time. Um, so sampling a little bit of, and, and really, I mean, if you're only gonna sample like uh, just the tiniest bit of, of a spirit, maybe like two of them, it's not like you're gonna having like three, four shots, okay? And in the period of the time that you're recording the video, you're probably not gonna get drunk. If you wanna see me get drunk, you can watch my Alco, Alcomate um, review where I sat there for watching Doctor Who, matter of fact, um, sat there for a little over an hour and took multiple shots and, and tested it and I did get drunk. Um, but anyway, so that's why, uh, second point, someone said my, they didn't like my intro music. You know what? We all have, we all have our, uh, we all have our musical tastes. I happen to like techno and trance and that type of stuff. And I wanted my intro song to be similar to, and wanted to have incorporate that type of style of music and also be somewhat uh, reminiscent of a podcast uh, that I listen to, um, Security Now, and actually Twit this week in tech. I don't really listen to Twit as much anymore. Um, I do listen to Security Now, which is a computer security podcast um, on the Twit network. So that was the purpose of the music. Um, I like it. I, I asked the composer to create something. <clears throat> it's Mark, Mark Blasco, I think his name is. As a matter of fact, remember, I'll put a link in the show notes on the website, on the website, not on YouTube, on the website if you want to go check out a site. Um, I didn't get the exclusive license for the song. Um, I don't know if I could now, but if you want the song, you can do it. And the ending, the, the outro music is just, it was publicly 
or, or, or music you could buy off of a website. And I used that song. I had him use that song as a little bit of a basis for the intro song. Um, and then someone said the intro was too long because they saw my uh, Corvin episode where I did like four minutes of, of like, you know, talking about how I had uh, the Ridge uh, three, three vines, three vines uh, or three vineyards uh, Zen. And I was talking about how six months later it tasted just fine. So um, somebody complained about that. And then in that same, that for that same video, someone else complained that my video was too shaky and uh, to don't watch my videos. And I fired back at him and then he said I was being unprofessional and I fired right back saying, you were the one who started the unprofessionalism. And uh, he never, he never, I gave him, I said, you can contact me, email, whatever. He didn't contact me. So if you want to hate on me, you can hate on me all you like. I don't really care. I have almost 400 episodes. I have a lot of, I have a lot of people that view my, view my videos. Um, I'm not some, I'm not a YouTube uh, celebrity. Obviously I'm not making money at it. This is not my job. I do this for me and anyone who wants to watch it. And if you don't like my videos, that's cool, man. You know what? There's a ton of other people you can watch that maybe you like better. Um, they do produce really great content. Um, so I'm not, I'm not everyone's cup of tea. It's not going to hurt my feelings. Anyway, that was my rant. So I really want to do that. Next wine, wine number two. All right. This wine is the Vovetti, which I think, yeah. Okay, the Vovetti uh, Pinot Grigio, not Pinot Grigio, <laughs> Vovetti Prosecco, because of the P, um, but it comes from the land of Pinot Grigio. So let's, uh, we're gonna pull up all their little, get, close all these little things. I don't know why I closed them all, because I, I need them for later. All right, so um, this wine was graciously uh, donated to me by Claudia Pehar, um, or Pahar, I'm not really sure, from Frigine, AKA or and or Gloria Ferrer. And um, this wine uh, is suggested retail price of $17. And um, in, in her little um, email to me, and it's replicated on the website, it says uh, that Vovetti, the name of Vovetti was, was inspired by the Latin word voveo, meaning to vow or to promise. Uh, said that Vovetti is a unique marriage between the cool climate viticulture of Northern Italy's most acclaimed Prosecco regions in Veneto and the superb winemaking of Friuli Venezia Giulia. Um, here a gentle hand crafts Italy's most treasured white wines. The result of over 100 years of family making expertise, Vovetti brings together the Ferrer's family sparkling wine legacy with the Colavini's family's Colavini ma family's mastery of crafting some of Italy's finest whites, which I have not looked up to see what they do. Um, the result is uh, artist, art, artisan Prosecco. All right, so. A little bit more bubbles to that. No, I did not do the uh, true and official way to open the wine. I didn't have it angled at 45 degrees the entire time, but I'm the only one here, so. Ain't no thing, ain't nothing but chicken wing. Boom. All right. So Prosecco. Um, so the uh, the grape, no, I don't need that. The grape was known as Prosecco, um, but now it's Galera, if I remember correctly. And um, the website that I had up for this reset back to the, um, the, the splash screen asking if I was 21 years old or not. Um, you know what, when they were asked to put your birth date in them, I was like January 1st of, and I just pick a year. I think it's just silly that they put that age thing on there. Like, what 16 year old's gonna go, no, or put their actual birthday in there? Well, maybe, maybe they don't know. Maybe they're stupid enough to think that the website's gonna track it or know that they're lying. Anyway, um, so I wanted to pull up some of the, uh, well, yeah, well, I don't want to read all the tasty notes. It just says 100% um, Glera, not Galera. Glera is the grape, the official grape name. Um, and I already talked about the two families. And you know what? That's, that's it. And where it's from. All right. It's already done. All right. So on the nose, it's like a really pretty nose. 
it's almost like it's almost um like a like almost uh, a spice driven nose and potpourri yeah it's almost like walking into like uh a world market or a uh or a, or a pier one type of thing and you get all those awesome like spiced kind of you know wood uh, aromas or or like an antique shop you know with some you know some aromas like that with you got some orange and honeysuckle and wax um wax candles like you've ever gone to one of those little like antique shops or like one of those little specialty shops in like a you know like a little town and they've got like the like the candle selection. They've got all those scented candles and you can just smell it when you walk in the door or when you walk down the little air or the area of the like it's an old house usually it's an old house that, that they convert into a shop, right? It, it gives me that type of memory. But definitely a preponderance of orange, uh honeysuckle. Uh, melon, those types of aromas. Hmm. That's pretty tasty. Um, Prosecco is one of those wines that is, like I guess lots of wines, wide range of quality levels. You've got that kind of quality level, and then you have, I guess, awesome quality level, which I can't say that I've had an awesome Prosecco, but I've had some Proseccos that were that were serviceable, and I've had some Proseccos that really tasted good. And this is one of those. I mean, it's $17. It's not a, um, it's not a expensive bottle of wine by any means, but it's not cheap like $5.99. Um, but uh, it, it's tasty. Um, there's a bit of um, tartness, tart orange um, to it. There's a good mouthfeel to it. I mean, you really feel the bubbles um, in your mouth. There's a, a slight creaminess to it, like almost a creamsicle type of thing to it. Um, there's also a bitter component that I'm getting like in the back end. Um, so it's kind of off-putting on that. But it's really, a, to me, a ponderous of orange. And I don't know if, if the orange circles are supposed to reinforce the, the idea of orange and nectarine, but it really does... We really just have that in there, and I have no idea. I don't remember what the. Sh I don't even really read what they're. What do they say? Uh, they said honeysuckle. Uh, oh, they have pear, green apple, melon, peach. Hmm. Hmm. I can see the peach and the green apple. I don't really get um, the pear necessarily, but you know, very much like that stuff. But. You do get a creamy mouthfeel to it. There is a bit of a creamsicle type of, of a, or flavor to it. Um, it was very pleasant. I said it was a, there was a touch of bitterness on the back end. And I don't know if it's just maybe more about the acidity in the because I'm really salivating. <clears throat> it was the acidity that's like drying out things. And, and maybe that's why I'm, I'm, I'm confusing that with bitterness. But yeah, um, it's, it's good wine. I, I enjoy it. Um, I would say if you want something like this, then you absolutely buy it. Um, if you're into that type of stuff, um, we're already over 30 minutes, so let's let's get moving on. All right, wine number three. Boom. We're gonna move these down the line. All right, um, this is the Nicholas Fouillat um, Reserve Brut Reserve Champagne. Right, so these guys, these guys have been around for a little bit. Um, Pardon me. Actually, I didn't even see when they were founded. Yes, enter. I mean, these websites just they um they reset their stuff. All right, that was easy enough. All right, 
So um, this wine was a gift um, by uh, one of my buddies in the wine industry, works for a distributor. Like I said, it was a belated birthday gift, plus he just wanted to do something special for me. Um, so I really appreciated it. And uh, uh, it retails for right around, on wine.com, it retails for about $35, okay? So nothing too terribly expensive, but um, definitely not... Um, Definitely not the uh, uh, um, not super expensive, right? And, and definitely not like a value wine. So let's let's do this right here. Um, so these guys um, they work with about twenty two hundred hectares of vineyards and and growers. Oop, a little bit of pop there, a little celebration action. And um, uh, oh, that's not what I want. I want this wine here, Fruit Reserve. Boom. And uh, they have, I think they said 14 Grand Cru's that they pull from. Let me try to get the, uh, here we go, Savoir Faire. Stein off that this maybe it's in that one. No, that's the uh, that's the winemaker. There we go. Exceptional alliance. All right. So um, yeah, I don't I didn't I don't remember seeing anywhere that saying when they were founded. I probably should look it up on the Wikipedia page. But uh, they use all three the all the great varietals, uh, Chardonnay, Pinot Noir, and um, it's now supposed to be referred to as Meunier, not Pinot Meunier. Um, that's why I got told recently at a master class. Um, but anyway, they use 13 of the 17 Grand Cru vineyards, 33 of the 42 Premier Cru um, vineyards, and then 259 of the, th of the 320 other Cru's from the Champagne Appalachian. 2,250 hectares um, uh, what, is what they, they grow from or they get from, and um, they have, there's like 5,000 grape growers, uh, which actually that's not them, that's the whole region i think that's what they're trying to say um their wines in general uh are tw uh they they, they use 25 percent chardonnay 25 percent pinot noir and 50 percent pinot meunier or meunier and i'll even tell them what what they say the each grape brings chardonnay with its floral and citrus notes brings elegance and finesse to the champagne while the pinot noir with its red fruit aromas and considerable structure brings body and power Finally, Meunier imparts softness, roundness, and fruit character to the wines. And uh, aging, they like to talk about their aging. So um, let's see here. They, they mentioned that uh, by law, a champagne uh, needs to be, um, a brute champagne must spend at least 15 months in the cellars and three years uh, of aging for vintage champagne. Um, they typically age their their uh, champagnes for longer than that, and they're not the only ones. Uh, actually, a lot of a lot of champagne houses actually um, age their wines for longer than the bare minimum. So uh, the Brut Reserve is aged for three years in the cellars, um, and it is they didn't, they didn't give us the um, the breakdown necessarily. But uh, it just says a range of different crews make up the blend. So let's talk about blending real quick. Um, so this is uh, this is a non-vintage blend, and it will have a certain style to it. And they have to keep a certain amount of wine back every year for reserve wine, um, so that they can continue having a. They have like this continuation of style, and so your 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 winemakers. They're, they're blending these wines from year to year to year, and each each individual wine needs to needs to stay in a certain style. Um, so it's kind of kind of weird that they have that. And sometimes, so like in the, in the case of Krug, what I went through a master class with them. Not a master class, but actually it was a master class that they 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 use Krug, and then another class just on Krug. They actually think that think of their special cuvées um, or their their uh, Grand Cuvées. Um, as the same as vintage, they need they, in their in their eyes the quality should be the same. Um, so some champagne houses will have that type of attitude about their non-vintage offerings. Anyway, um, so if you think about it, it, it takes a lot of skill to make this wine taste the same from year to year to year that it's actually produced. Um, 
So let's go right into it. There you go. There's that bready, yeasty type of aroma that we get from champagne. Yeah, it's like walking into a bakery. I mean, that, that's the predominant smell right now for me. Touch of orange, touch of tangerine, touch of green apple. I'm going to swirl it up. I know Eric will kill me for doing that. It's like an apple pie, like a green apple pie. A uh, touch of caramel to it too. But definitely the predominant aroma is bread or yeast or that type of aroma. Um, but really, really pretty nose. I would definitely not mind smelling this for a while, but let's get going. Definitely the most bubbles of all three. Um, the biggest mouth, feel, the, the 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 fuller or the most the fullest mouth feel. Um, also, probably the highest acid of the three, um, and just just the more the creamiest of the three. Um, it's definitely got all that brioche and 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 toasted uh, uh, toasted um, bread uh, quality to it. Uh, it's got the green apple to it. Not as much of the orange and the tangerine as I got on the nose, but it's still there a little bit. Um, it's just a delicious wine. Um, the mouthfeel alone is just luxurious compared to the other wines. Um, but it's also a $35 bottle of wine. It's also an actual champagne. So <clears throat> this is kind of an like apples and oranges and pears comparison, right? Um, each of these wines are, are in their own class. Um, and they are only expected to perform a certain amount. I, it, you're not gonna you're not gonna put a Ferrari next to a next to an Escort, okay? Do you make Escort ne next to an Escape? How about that? Ford Escape and a Ferrari. I don't even they make it Ford Escorts anymore. Um, you're just not going to. They're not the same car. They're not the same quality build. Uh, they both get you to where you want to go, just in different style and different speed. Um, and I'm not trying to say this is Ferrari and this is an escape or Ford Fiesta, but the, the idea is that um, these wines are in their own classes. Oh man, it, I'm still tasting this wine. Um, and it's really that, that, again, all the bready and yeasty and the bakery and like you just walk into a bakery. I mean, it's like, it's like almond, it's like an almond. Oh yeah. It's like, it's like an apple almond like muffin, you know, with a little bit of nuts, a little bit of like a, uh, wal uh, well, almond, but like also um, um, uh, like walnuts um, in it too. Yeah, that's what it's like. It's like I just had this muffin, has apples in it, and um, and some nuts, and it's kind of got an extra bit of toast to it, like it like it was baked a little bit extra, so it's kind of caramelized and browned. Yeah. I'm not, I'm not spitting the rest of that. I'm swallowing that. Anyway, um, really good. 35 bucks. You're not breaking the bank by any means um, by, by having this wine. It's really delicious. I really highly recommend it. Um, I'll have links in the show notes, uh, links on the website <clears throat> uh, for everything that you see here and extra information. Um, if you're looking for some, you know, if you're looking to step your game up a little bit without breaking the bank, absolutely Nicholas Fiat. If you want something that's a little more reasonable and you're not worried about whether it's champagne or not, but you want like, you want the champagne method, you want the actual bubbles, you know, you want, you want it to produce the same way, then the Vovetti uh, Prosecco uh, definitely can do it. And if you need to go on the cheap or you need to buy, you know, a ton of wines for a big party and, uh, and you need, you need to go someplace that's going to have a lot of stock or something like so this would be one of those wines that will probably have a lot of stock of. Um, you need like two, three cases of it, then go with this. And honestly, your guests aren't going to notice. 
They're, they're, I mean, the wine snob will notice, but your guests um, aren't really going to be able to notice that maybe between these two, maybe. They'll definitely know the difference between these two. Um, but they'll have a good time. They're not there for the wine. They're there for the experience. And this is just to help lubricate the experience, right? So everything has this place. Um, if you want something really nice to drink at home and you want champagne, obviously Nicholas Fiat, if you want something that's just nice and sparkling, this Vovetti is it's definitely serviceable. It's good. I, I, would, I wouldn't hesitate paying $17 for it. That's really good. Anyway, that's going to do it for um, this episode. Um, it's the end of the year. So um, I want everyone to have a safe rest of this year because I'm putting this out on Christmas. No, uh, the day after Christmas, putting this uh, video out. Um, please be safe uh, for New Year's Eve. Uh, I will be working at my day job, which will be extended well to the well into the night. So hopefully on my way home, all the drunk, super drunk people are already at their destinations or in jail. Um, but please be safe. Uh, Use ride sharing, use a cab, use a designated driver uh, for New Year's Eve. Please do that um, because it's not fun to have the aftermath. And um, you can click the links above the front of me up. Click the link over here for the PayPal. It's kind of actually down there a little bit um, to uh, send a donation if you'd like. And show notes are down there. And uh, we'll see you again next time.